Hello, this is Harriet Grayson, your host and producer of Community Culture Showcase. And my objective is to promote the arts and culture and all those beautiful little museums and historic houses and the artists and the poets from our communities because we have, luckily, such wealth of great talent around. And I have as my guest today someone who represents one of those great, great little gems here in this community, Custom House Maritime Museum. And I have the director, Susan, and Susan and I go back several years. We do, Harriet, mm -hmm. quite a while with all of your mm -hmm. um, grant writing workshops, which, have, which were a lot of fun to have at the museum. People really enjoyed that. Well, that's great to hear. We and of course, I've been here many times. Dead. Yeah. <laughs> yes, been and you've been my guest on this show. Yeah, quite and a And I've times. been your guest on, uh, on uh, the George's, show. George's. Yes, yeah, the George George's show. show. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So we're old timers, so we sit and we chat like we're old friends, which we are. Yeah. And the nice thing about it is that I credit you personally for getting this 19th century gem, which was in obscurity, and to bring it well. into the mindset of the 21st century because there's a tremendous amount of culture within that museum, and it represents a period of time in New London, uh, the glory years, which uh, they would like to bring back, not doing such a great job, but your museum is going to be part of the, the new New London. Uh, well, you know, Harriet, thank you. That's very kind of you to say. And I, I was really fortunate to get to the museum when I did. But I will say one thing about the museum that people don't understand, and it's not like uh, Lyman Allen or Mystic Seaport. We really are a community museum, which means you might come in and it looks kind of disheveled because we're building something kind of slowly in the middle of the main hall, or somebody has just loaned us a bunch of, well, say, deep sea diving gear, mm -hmm. which took a while to find its home, I will mm -hmm. say, wandered around the museum. But we're a real community museum, and we are, it's a very different, very different kind of a place, and it means that if somebody has a good idea, we try to work with it. You know that. Yes, because We do whatever yes. we can. We don't really say no very mm -hmm. often. It's true. And um, we do all kinds of programs. And I will mention one, this one. <laughs> it is Jaboom Club number one. It is uh, named for a group that was uh, a collection of old whaling captains and whaling crews okay. in the 1880s. And you know, when you went on those trips, you really did sink sea shanties to hoist the sails, and you had these incredible experiences together all around the world. Mm -hmm. And you came back to New London, and uh, I suppose it wouldn't be as bad as going back to Brantford, which <laughs> is where I'm from, but it was not the worldly experience. You know, people didn't share that. So when the whalers stopped whaling mm -hmm. and they were moving towards steamships, all these sailing men sort of formed a club, you know, like uh, like elks, but for for seamen. For seamen, and right. they would sing these songs and they'd make chowder, and they would um, have an annual parade. Oh, and uh, it went on until I think the 1950s. Mm. And Archie Chester, who a lot of people around here probably remember, he died just a couple years ago, actually joined the Jaboom Club when he was a teenager. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a wonderful kind of a unique thing. It was Jaboom Club number one because then they tried to start one in San Francisco, but it oh, didn't take. Okay. Uh, but it went on for decades and stopped and a few years ago uh, it was revived at the Maritime Museum and we have a meeting tomorrow and in the old days you used to have had to have uh, crossed the equator a couple times I think uh, but now you can just come mm -hmm. it's uh, from 1 to 4 on uh, Tuesday April 21st so it's the third Tuesday every month. And so it doesn't necessarily, if you can't catch it, this, this, because yeah. people maybe not be able to view it. Oh, that's right. Yes, yeah. but they'll know they can come in May, the third Tuesday. The third Tuesday. And, and there's it's a always, luncheon? Well, not a luncheon. Okay. It's a, it, there's a speaker, and you can uh, have coffee and cookies and listen to somebody talk, and it could be someone from the Coast Guard. This time it's a, it's a, somebody who was a submarine. Okay. Uh, submariner, and, uh, 
talking about the most dangerous uh, job in World War II, which I think probably has something to do with submarines. Okay. So, um, but <laughs> you know, probably mine sweeping or something. Yeah, it's <laughs> always it's always something interesting. Yes. And, you know, uh, one of the things uh, I was saying about the museum is that it's so incredibly fortunate. If you're a maritime museum, this is such a cross-section of maritime activities. Right. You have the Navy, you have the Coast Guard, you have the submarines, mm -hmm. you have research, you have the Arctic uh, uh, um, Ice Patrol, right. you have uh, NOAA, you have many, many different things here. So there's never any problem getting a speaker. Right, right. And um, as, as I was saying earlier, the museum itself is so incredibly fortunately situated mm -hmm. right on the end of Long Island Sound you know all and all that that means right uh, islands uh, rivers mm -hmm. many many lighthouses yes it's right near a transportation center right it's, the uh, Amtrak and the, yeah uh, the, so for us doing things like our lighthouse tours it's it's just the perfect place to have a package and put everything together and bring in people from out of town and uh, we've been so lucky with it the last five years we've been running it it's a really um, it never ceases to amaze me tell it tell the audience a little bit about your lighthouses oh. and how you um, how you got them okay. and making the museum the um, responsible for some of the most beautiful lighthouses in this part of the country yeah the um, a light historic lighthouse Protection Act of 2000 is uh, important because before 2000, these beacons, which had guided so many mariners to safety mm -hmm. over so many centuries, uh, when they were deemed surplus, they would just be sold and they might be a fish restaurant or something like that. And, and the people who actually served in, in these last decades, that would be the Coast Guard, mm -hmm. before that the Lighthouse Service, would, um, you know, were kind of annoyed at that. Mm -hmm. So they passed a bill to keep these historic structures uh, protected in some right. way. Right, so and they should reflect that uh, historic maritime history rather yeah. than to be something something else. And although they deem them excess, I know for a fact that the Fisher's Island Ferry always focuses on harbor light when they're coming in. They're mm -hmm. very good visual cues. Mm -hmm. and if you're out there in a storm and you're trying to look at your GPS, it's not the easiest thing or you're working with your sails. So mm -hmm. the lighthouses are maybe uh, not as critical as they once were, but they still serve a function. Right. So the federal government said, okay, well, uh, the lighthouses had been taken care of by the Coast Guard, and the Coast Guard, great as they are as painting, as we know, at painting, um, they're, not a, they're not a maintenance crew, mm -hmm. and these buildings needed real maintenance. So they said if any, but if any municipality, first they went to the municipality, if New London would take New London Harbor Light, we'll give it to you, and New London did not. Then right. they say if there is a um, nonprofit, and it doesn't have to be a local nonprofit, mm -hmm. because we were up against some from quite a distance away, mm. but if a nonprofit will accept this, and you have two main responsibilities. You have to provide access to the public, and it's a requirement. These are federally built structures, right. federally owned, and although they're given, you know, you might say given to right. us, they are not given to us ever. They mm -hmm. are held in trust for the federal government. So if they're going to give them to us, we have to in turn um, be the equivalent of a national park, mm -hmm. allow public access, okay. and also um, do the preservation. Ah. And we have to report every single year on mm -hmm. what we've done in mm. that regard. And, and some lighthouses, like Little Gull, were adopted by uh, nonprofit groups, and then the group didn't meet their uh, responsibilities. Wow, and they took them back. And they way. took it back. And mm -hmm. then what happened? Supposing uh, we didn't do what we had to do at Harbor Light. As you know, we're involved in a lawsuit with our neighbors. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why they don't want us there, but they don't. <laughs> and um, supposing we weren't there. You know, I figured out our hours. 
if you figured out the number of tours we give, and last year, let's just say none, because we were it was a construction site. We did the restoration bit. Right. I think 10 years worth of restoration in one year. Wow. But if you figured out the very small number of tours, it's like uh, two less than 2%. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, like, it's a tiny, tiny percentage of the hours. If someone, if, if we were to have to give the lighthouse back because uh, somebody had some demands or refused, whatever it was, mm -hmm. or we didn't meet our obligations in one way or another, um, somebody could build on the, uh, there was a building on our small land site. There would be a house, there would be people there all the time. It would right. be a very different situation. What we are, again, it's like a, like a national park. Mm -hmm. It would be very respectful and mm. the neighbors who live in the, uh, lighthouse keeper's house couldn't be nicer. Mm -hmm. They're nice as uh, sweet as And how many uh, lighthouses do you have? Well, uh, we have uh, New London Harbor Light, mm -hmm. which was applied for actually about 2002, long before I got here, six mm -hmm. years before I got here. And um, we just received that five years ago. Mm -hmm. Then um, I applied for Race Rock, and we received Race Rock Lighthouse, which actually is in New York. Okay. Right off of Fisher's Island, okay. right where the Long Island Sound opens out to um, the to, Atlantic. To the Atlantic, okay. And uh, this year, working with the Ledge Light Foundation, a very wonderful group, um, we are getting ownership of Ledge Lighthouse, which is, uh, if you watch any local weather forecast, <laughs> it's everybody's favorite lighthouse because it's adorable. It's the uh, square brick lighthouse in New London Harbor. Okay. Now you are this summer going to have tours of those lighthouses? Oh yeah. Well, you know, um, the, this is the thing. Uh, it's a requirement. Mm -hmm. And we, we started the very first year five years ago with one weekend of lighthouse tours. But now we do it just about every weekend. Okay. We don't go in the lighthouses every weekend, mm -hmm. but we have some sort of activity. And um, last year, in fact, we never went into Harbor Light until the very end in September. We had an open house, which was free, which we do twice a year anyway for the right. public because uh, the public is so, in I don't know, every time, I think about it so incredibly supportive. Right, right. I mean, there's, it's unbelievable how supportive they are. So we do free open house, usually at the beginning of the season and at the end of the season. Mm -hmm. And uh, last year at Harbor Light, it was only open that one day, really, mm. for the public. Um, but we do boat tours. That's oh. what we mostly do. And okay. the boat tours, um, some of them land at Ledge Light, uh, but most of them are harbor tours. Okay, so you stay in a boat, stay in a and boat. someone talks to you and describes the, the three different lighthouses, yeah. and I guess something about the maritime history of New London. Yeah, and I'll tell you, this year uh, we, do th we do things different every year, and somebody asked me just over at the Washington Street coffee shop before, <laughs> I, before I came here about the, about the tours for this year. And you know, we're not a uh, commercial enterprise, we're an educational enterprise, and we're always trying to do a better job and do things differently. And uh, we always, we don't go out and hire a boat or we hire local captains right. who have their own boats. So they're little tiny tours with six people per boat. Mm -hmm. And when it's that small, if you want to hear about the architecture or you want to hear about the local uh, seafood, we can go in any direction you right. want. Right, customized. Yeah, because you know, our, our tour givers are people who just love the area. Mm -hmm. And we, we have, over this past year, been working to get them a body of information. Mm -hmm. And our, our uh, goal is not what you think. It's not just to teach about the lighthouses or even New London history. It's really, since to Earth Day is like in two days, right. to say it's to stop global warming mm. and to make anybody we can snare with our lighthouses and get on Long Island Sound to appreciate it and to come back at least one more time. Mm -hmm. So if somebody comes in and you mention something about the scallop 
Niantic scallops or sea scallops off of uh, State Pier oh, or, right. or, or boomsters out of Stonington. Right. This year, we're going to try to have all that information for them and uh, say, if you're from out of town, do you want to eat this? This is where they serve it. Or if you're local, do you want to buy it? Mm -hmm. This is where you can go. Mm -hmm. And in fact, with um, Elisa from uh, Monge 2, which just closed on State Street in New London, and uh, a, f a friend of hers, uh, we're going to do a series of uh, cooking classes. Oh. This is a exclusive <laughs> yes. because we just uh, <laughs> we just figured it out. I just I just saw Elisa closing her store a couple weeks ago. And I stopped in, and she said she'd be doing cooking classes. I said, well, please do them for us. And the idea is we're going to do them at uh, the Big House, which is a bed and breakfast in New London. Oh, so okay. imagine if you were taking the train from New York for mm -hmm. this quaint weekend in New London. Right. If you want something funky and real, you don't want to go to, you know, you want to go someplace real. You can, you can go to the Big House and on Friday night have a cooking class with, say, tilapia from the marine magnet school <laughs> over here in Groton. And then part B is somebody from the school will give a little talk and the public can come. Mm. The public could be in that small class or they could come to part B and hear about the school and the fish and uh, issues with fishing. Right. And that's your introduction to town. So mm. you're here with all this local information. And then you still have Saturday and Sunday to take our harbor tours. Mm. Or Sundays, every Sunday, Project Oceanology will be in New London giving trips out to Ledge Light. And that's quite spectacular because the Ledge Light Foundation has new um, exhibits. They're mm -hmm. going to have a new video this summer. Every, everything is great with that lighthouse. In fact, I often think it's a much better display than we have at the Custom House, but <laughs> you can't get there for most of the year. You right. have to go on this <laughs> boat, and, and it's, but it's well worth it. It's so much fun and such mm. a great group of people who, who run that, but we work together. Right. In another press release uh, that just went out this morning about the summer is another great group in town, Wheeling City Tours, do Segway tours. Oh, on those, on those funny looking things. Those yes. funny looking things. Yes, and yes. we just agreed to let them go inside the lighthouse. Oh. So every afternoon you can book a tour to take the Segway by Ocean Beach, by Pequot Chapel, mm -hmm. and you can see the other lighthouses. Yeah, in fact, you can see Avery Point. You can see quite a few right. from the shore, but they'll end up at Harbor Light. And if you'd like to, you can climb the 119 steps to the top. I have done it. Yeah, it's great, isn't <laughs> yeah, it? You yes. have your whole family. <laughs> yes, yeah, yes. Well, it's, it's, a, it's unbelievably great. It is. It's, it's right fantastic. There. Yes. And for years, of course, for 200 years, nobody could do it mm -hmm. except for the Coast Guard right. or whoever was, you know, in charge. And uh, now you'll be able to do it with the Segway tours. And of course, whatever money we make from that per person goes back into the lighthouse fund because every dollar we make, every penny we make from the lighthouses, it doesn't pay my salary. Right. And I will say I'm the only employee at the custom house. It's right. all volunteer. It's a yes. very great, great group. Yes. Yes. Um, but every penny we make from lighthouse adventures of any sort mm -hmm. go into maintenance of the lighthouses. And, you know, I, and I have to also commend you for the fact that you go out and see collaborations, not only, oh, yeah. you know, all over the place, commercial interests and nonprofits yeah. and the schools. Yeah. Uh, for that, you certainly should be patted on the back because we have a terrible uh, uh, kind of thinking about yeah. oh it's me 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, my, and there are wonderful institutions around yeah. but it's not me 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 for the greater good of the public it should be us 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 it was a real learning curve mm -hmm. when I got here because I had worked for a couple of years with the um, New, Lo New Haven Arts and Ideas Festival and that was a very collaborative group. And before that, I was in um, Washington, D.C. for 20 years, and I taught for the Smithsonian, worked with the Smithsonian and other Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, and everybody is kind of friendly. And to come here, New London, it was like, if you get something, I don't get it. Right. Or it, was, it was very, uh, it was not 
being square with other people and right. you learn your lesson. There are some mm -hmm. people, forget it, I'm not going to mm -hmm. work with, but there are other people and by, by and large the, the, the majority of organizations sure. understand this and it's so much more fun when you work together. For instance, these Segway tours and the Ledge Light tours, we're now partners and they do it all and, mm -hmm. and it's not we want all this to to thrive. We want everything to thrive right. because it all uh, feeds everything else. Exactly. It's a win-win for everybody. Yeah. If you get more people to come downtown, to come to your museum, to come to the train station, yeah. you everybody work, makes out. I mean, the stores yeah. make out, the restaurants do better. Yeah. It, to bring in the traffic here because a lot of people, you know, may have come from New London but have thought, have, you know, kind of dusted it off. Well, yeah. it, in order for it to be vibrant again, you know, and I I am wearing my former urban planner Yeah, you're hat. an urban planner. I'm an urban planner. Yes, Harriet. exactly. So yeah. collaboration is the way to go. Yeah. And generally the government um, looks forward to collaborations, doesn't want everything to be se uh, segregated and, and pieced away. They like yeah. things to be together. They get, figure they get more bang for the buck. And, and more people can, can win by such a situation. And of course, you're right. There is that mindset, which you have been successful at breaking away yeah. to get stuff uh, happening. Well, you know, and, and you have to uh, sort of, there's the, the grand thinking, oh, we're going to do this, this, and this, and or one big thing is going to mm -hmm. save us, like the Coast Guard Museum. And I hope we get the Coast Guard Museum. We would be their best partner. They would be interactive, modern, two blocks away. We would be the historic gem, mm -hmm. you know, up the street. We, we, we had how many? Nine Coast Guard cadets helping us out on Saturday mm -hmm. all day, cleaning the lighthouse, working at the uh, at the museum, actually giving tours. We right. have a very close collaboration with the Coast Guard Museum. There's nothing I'd like better than for that museum to happen. But we're not waiting for a silver bullet. We're, mm -hmm. we're building from our strengths. Right. And um, you know there have been a couple of false starts, but now we have a pretty good mass and. The newsletter, if you if you all go out and uh, get find one of these newsletters, right, the, right. The point of the front is that whereas uh, seven years ago people would not have uh, contacted us for anything, right. Now we were contacted uh, last summer mm -hmm. in the midst of what was a massive restoration effort and fundraising year right. to get Harbor Light restored. We were contacted by, well, first The Bachelor. The Bachelor wanted to film a date and a... Um, the TV show. The TV show oh. at Harbor Light. They wanted mm. to come to the Custom House and, and we didn't get it. And uh, some people say, good for you. <laughs> but I really wanted it. Sure. And when they panned the Connecticut coast, because part of it was in Connecticut, they did show the lighthouse. Right. Because they, th we were there up until the last minute. OK. But uh, three months later, like April, May, June, uh, National Geographic called. National Geographic Channel, which is different than the esteemed anthropological and naturalist uh, <laughs> magazine we all know from the past. It is a very, uh, I don't know, it's, a, it's anyway. <laughs> A slick, or, a slick organization. Well, mm -hmm. they have their own audience, that's yeah. all I can say. Okay. And, and they contacted us out of the blue. Out of every lighthouse imaginable, they decided on Race Rock. And like right. I said, the three lighthouses we have are phenomenal. The first one was the Connecticut stamp, you know, Harbor Light for the U.S. Postal Service mm. two years ago. You know, how lucky can you get? Right. Um, just the year we were starting our fundraising mm -hmm. to repaint. It's just one lucky thing after another. It's not always luck. It's also a matter of having kind of set the pace wow. and done your homework. So I want to I want you to get more credit than pure luck. Although lady luck yeah. plays a part in everything in life. 
it's not only lady luck. It's you've, you've dug the uh, foundation and therefore the building can get built. Well, Race Rock, Race Rock was, um, I think they're in your, in your neck of the woods in Rhode Island right. is where they do Ghost Hunters, mm -hmm. that television show. And the very first two episodes years ago were about Race Rock because mm -hmm. it's this haunted lighthouse and very forbidding and very difficult to land at. And in fact, although we owned it as of last June for a year, we had never landed ourselves at the lighthouse. We'd wow. only gone with the Coast Guard because the um, force of water mm -hmm. and the cross currents mm. and the fact that the uh, riprap arms that made the little slip have been dashed over mm. um, mean that when you go in with the Coast Guard, they're always keeping the engine going so you're yeah. not drawn into the rocks. Okay. And you have to jump out of the boat up a <laughs> totally vertical metal ladder and oh. then you get to the platform and then there's one at a slight angle it's it's mm. challenging and when national geographic called i said listen um you don't want to go here you want to go to ledge light mm. so much easier that's perfect for you they said no we <laughs> we're national geographic we go anywhere <laughs> which they do and they did and mm. really we just negotiated george spicacci our our president negotiated a contract where quite a bit of work was done on the lighthouse mm. um, it was so uh in such bad uh shape windows in the attic were broken mm. lots of pigeon guano <laughs> everywhere dead pigeons oh. everything oh. that you wouldn't have even wanted to bring people in to ask for help, right. you know, it was so kind of filthy. And the paint was all in little curls. It was <laughs> like a terry cloth, uh, all the walls. Right, right, right. Well, right. National Geographic agreed to use HEPA, uh, all the safe and uh, uh, ecologically sound means to clean the whole lighthouse. Wow and uh, replace the windows and do all of that work. Uh, a, a wonderful uh, local person, uh, Brooks Kuhn, was mm. selected to be the person to live out there oh. alone for three weeks. Mm. And um, she did a lot of the work. But there was a lot of work done because we wouldn't let her out there while there were dead pigeons and things. Yes, of course, of course. And um, uh, it, it was like, a, a gift to get mm -hmm. that because it's it's not like harbor light which mm. is bad enough right which is on the shore yes it's on an island and how do you get rid of that lead paint mm -hmm. right you don't throw it in the ocean right. certainly mm -hmm. it's all HEPA collected yes and, uh, hazardous disposable right. waste so right. for us um, it was terrific and we got to meet wonderful Brooks Kuhn who is mm. now a friend who was the um, she had been the uh, captain of a ship, and she oh. ran the Quinnipiac schooner in New Haven, oh. and she was down in the Bahamas forever. Extremely capable, funny, and also an author like you, an oh. author. And uh, she runs Ms. Maintenance, which is a local oh. uh, repair business, and she was selected to be the person on the uh, National Geographic show, and she wow. does a terrific job. The rest of the program, I have to say, is a might uh, macabre. Mm. Uh, uh, that's all I'll say. Oh, <laughs> because I don't know. They have aliens. They have. <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't seem like National Geographic to me. But the, <laughs> but but Race Rock is the emblem, is the picture they use for the whole series, and okay. it is the reoccurring image. And clearly, they know it's a great. I catch you. Yes. And the other lucky thing, I was talking mm. about lucky things, is the Amistad. Now, yes. for as long as you've known me, yes. since I've been here, we have been the best partner to that ship. And mm. whatever their finances, whatever their management has been, we love the story. And for New London, that is at our Maritime Museum, it is the key story. Tell, tell people the story, because for those who may be, uh, may not re realize this incredible historical thing. Well, 176 years ago in um, uh, January, a great number of Africans were taken uh, captive and shipped over to Cuba on one of those enormous slave ships called the Tacora. 
once in Cuba, about 53 were purchased, including children, and put on a little uh, Baltimore schooner called La Amistad, which means friendship. Mm -hmm. And they were going to be taken uh, from one area in Cuba to another where there were um, sugarcane plantations. Mm -hmm. And so on the ship, along with the 53 people, were um, sugarcane knives and oh, fabrics and mirrors and uh, nails, all sorts of things. Right. On that, on that cruise, the little girls were let. Well, there was a little girl, two girls, and uh, two boys and a girl who were young, who were not shackled, mm -hmm. and they found the knives. And there was um, Singbei, who was the the head, really, of the group, mm -hmm. um, a natural leader, right type. Um, who had been a blacksmith who could use the nails to undo the shackles. Mm. And they, even though the Africans spoke different languages, they were able to communicate and come up with a plan mm -hmm. to overthrow the um, men who were running the ship, right. which they did. Mm -hmm. And uh, there they were off the coast of uh, Cuba. They didn't kill everyone, which is what they used to say before mm. Obama opened up Cuba and they got mm -hmm. some of the records. Mm -hmm. They actually put people on a boat and sent them to Cuba and said, you can go, but we, right. we killed the captain and the cook to get our freedom, and right. now we want to go back where the sun rises, mm -hmm. back to the uh, east, to Africa. And they knew they couldn't do it in that little boat, so the ship sailed up the coast and uh, people, quite a few people saw it from America. They, they saw these cap, well, they saw Africans, black-skinned mm -hmm. people, wrapped in these cloths, which right. were the cloths in the hold, and they thought they were pirates. Oh. There's a lot of commotion, a lot of writing in the press. Finally, when they got up to Montauk and had gone ashore to get some water, they were intercepted uh, by a, a revenue cutter, the Washington, and they were not taken into New York where they were mm -hmm. because New York was a free state. There mm. was no slavery whatsoever. They were taken into Connecticut where it was not <coughs> legal to purchase, you know, enslaved people. Right, but, but slaves that but, were there were still slaves. Yeah, and so the, the hope was they could get a certain amount of uh, tariff for bring or duty or something for bringing the, the, the people back into Connecticut. And uh, the amazing thing is, when they got to New London, a local grocer got on board, and he was also an abolitionist. Mm. And when he got off the ship, he said, these people are brought here illegally. There had been a law, transatlantic slave trade, uh, abolition of the transatlantic slave trade treaty, which had been signed 20 years before, which abolished the trade. But this was an illegal act. Of course, it was being done, just like all illegal acts mm -hmm. are always being carried out you know, by somebody. And uh, the abolitionist, Dwight Jaynes, thought this was a case that they could really bring to court. And he wrote to the famous abolitionist, Lewis Tappan, and various people in uh, New York, New Haven, and Boston, and they didn't respond. Mm. So he wrote again, which is a good lesson. One right. person can have it make a difference, and not maybe the first time. Right, but, but you be have persistent. To be yes. persistent. Yes. And what happened is the captives um, had had a helping hand, which meant the abolitionists were looking out for them. They finally got their uh, day in court and went all the way to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. They were defended by John Adams, ex-president, right. yes. and won their freedom, mm -hmm. and then went back to Africa. Mm -hmm. So the, um, the 175th anniversary of them coming into New London, which in fact is the only place the Amistad ship ever was, mm. because it remained with customs right. until the end of the trial when it was sold and then um, went down to the Caribbean. Um, <clears throat> the, um, the 175 years ago last year was when the ship came in. 175 years ago, next 
March 9th is the anniversary of the end of the trial. Okay. So it's like 18 months. Right. And then the next January is uh, the anniversary of their return to Africa. Mm. So in terms of uh, anniversaries, observation of anniversaries, and, right. and the life of the Amistad ship, this is a very significant moment. Yes. As everybody knows, it's had its uh, financial woes right, and detractors right. and all kinds of right. nastiness. And you have in the museum yeah. had a, a wonderful exhibit about we the We do. Animal. And through all of this, mm -hmm. we have said, ship or no ship, the story is fantastic. Yes, yes. And through you know, through that story, we actually brought a large portion of that exhibit to the um, main hall of the United Nations. Oh. And I spoke to the United Nations at the opening, and everyone knew the Amistad story. Mm. It's known uh, here in New London, people sometimes get tired of it, mm. but around the world, it's phenomenal. And there are, there are three reasons, I'll tell you why. Um, one, it turns out with new scholarship, one in 10 ships carrying enslaved people had a major insurrection. Ah. But what ones have you ever heard of? Right, right. right they didn't. It's not that people were passive. Right. They were beaten down, but they tried mm. to rebel. Right. In New London, they had that helping hand. Mm. And I think the Africans are the heroes of the story. But there were some significant supporting players, beginning with our own Dwight James, a local mm. grocer. Right. And then, of but course. Who was opposed to slavery? Who was opposed to slavery? Yes, yes. The other thing is, while they were in prison at the first part of the trial process, a 19-year-old young man in New Haven did portraits of 38 of mm. these captives. And how many of the millions of enslaved people do we have portraits of them as individuals? Interesting. There are almost none. Right. This is a, that's a phenomenal thing. Then number three, actually there's a fourth one, but yes. number three is uh, the, uh, the captives because they were telling a story, and it was a heroic story, mm -hmm. and it was a freedom story, right. which resonated with this relatively young country. Um, they found, uh, by learning to count in the African language and going down to the docks and counting in that language, they found um, a sailor whose name was Covey, who was able to translate. So um. we have the actual words and thoughts of these people who were in, enslaved mm. in the in the 1830s and that wow. is also un, unknown really. Yes, yes. Um, one great thing about that, the ship uh, is in, what would you call it, receivership. Mm -hmm. um, they're planning what the future will be for the Amistad ship right, right now. Right. So because it's not in the best uh, condition, they're going to just, it's at Mystic Seaport right now. Mm -hmm. The U.S. Coast Guard cadets uh, uprigged it mm -hmm. uh, two weekends ago. They're going to sail it here, I guess, uh, end of April, and oh. it will be in New London from May through October, pretty much. Yes. Um, May 1st at 12.30, it's going to be a New London welcome to the Amistad. Ah. That also really hasn't been announced. Yes. And a couple of school choruses will be there to mm -hmm. sing, and mm -hmm. uh, maybe the mayor will say something. We're wow. hoping to get uh, Manny Rivera from, we don't know who we're going to get, um, mm -hmm. Reverend Heislop. A couple of people to say a few words, but it's basically not about speeches. It's about just saying, a new start, we welcome the ship to New London. Right, right. Because all these years, we've never had it here for more than a couple of days mm -hmm. a year. And when was the ship actually built? This, because this is, of course, this a replica. One, yeah, the replica was about 15 years ago. 15 years ago, okay. Yeah. And all this stuff I told you about the um, one in 10 ships with the rebellion, and mm -hmm. all this actually is new scholarship. There's a lot of new scholarship, and we're reviewing, uh, because this is so important to have, um, hold that up. <laughs> Because it's so important to have the ship here, right? We've made, uh, we've announced that school groups can come October. I mean, May through October. Mm -hmm. We'll we'll book tours. We've been asked to do the dockside education, and as you mentioned, we have a pretty great oh, exhibit. Oh yes, yes, yes. And uh, everybody at the Custom House loves that story. Mm -hmm. I mean, every, anybody will tell you that story because it's, right. it's a powerful thing. Yes, absolutely. Um, 
uh, but we thought, well, much as we like what we do, maybe it's not the most up-to-date thing we could. So I wrote to Marcus Redeker, who is the leading scholar on the Amistad, and he actually visited two years ago when his book came out. And he actually is the person who, uh, all the research had been done in this country. Like mm -hmm. I said, they hadn't gone to Cuba, because you right, couldn't, go to couldn't Cuba. get to Cuba. Right. Well, he got to Cuba, mm -hmm. and he went to Africa. And you'd say, oh, all the wars in Africa, rebellions in Sierra Leone, how could you find anything? Well, it's a very strong oral tradition. And when you think about it, it's only 175 years ago, mm -hmm. there are actual relatives of some of the captives wow. that he believes he found, mm -hmm. and he has their stories. And so Marcus Redeker, I wrote to him, I said, you know, we need some help. We do the best we can, but mm. we want to be sure we're giving the best possible. And the true story. True yes. story. Yes. And so he said, well, I'll come right up. So oh. he's coming on the 5th. The 5th uh, of? May. 5th of May, okay. He's going to meet with a group of educators from mm. all over the state mm -hmm. because it's going to be part of the uh, all Connecticut curriculum for this celebratory year from the Supreme Court trial, uh -huh. which is next March right. through the end of the year till right. January. And so he's going to come and then for free and open to the public at Public Library of New London. Okay. This, uh, this will. Ghosts of Amistad. Ghosts of Amistad. And yes. that's um, yes. documenting uh, Marcus Redeker's trip to Africa, mm. actually finding the villages that various of the captives went, were taken from and returned to when they went back to Africa, and telling what the story is of the real heroes of the story. And do you think that has got to do with the fact that the Cuba opened up and that's how they were, he oh, was yeah. able to yeah, be able to get that information? Yeah. Fascinating. Well, this is a great story, and it's got a great story because it's, it's a Connecticut story, but it's also a larger picture yeah. of this whole abolitionist movement. Mm -hmm. I mean, our, our young people know nothing about history, but this is a kind of way to inspire them yes. about history and about, you know, Adams's part in it also makes it larger than just Connecticut. Yeah. And of course, the whole abolitionist movement is something that, you know, young people, I don't think we adequately address the fact that we were a big, huge slave country. Yeah, Connecticut. Connecticut and the whole country, the country yeah. and Connecticut too, um, and uh, and that we had a, and that it was actually existed to make money. It was not it was not kind of a racial thing per se. Yeah. It was a thing about making money. Slaves mm -hmm. made money for people, and the whole slave route where you capture them and take them from Africa to the Caribbean was all about them selling them and then getting uh, molasses and sugarcane and other kinds of goods, bringing them to the Americas and then back to Europe. Yeah. Yeah, and New London was a very big uh, player. In fact, Archie Chester's great, 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 great relative was the captain who started the West Indies mm. uh, trade in New London. Okay, and it was a very big player in the in in that trade providing horses and mm. onions and all <laughs> sorts of things that were grown on farms here because the property in the islands was too valuable to oh. grow food. They mm. were growing sugar cane, mm -hmm. you know, sugar. And um, that's why New London was so late getting into whaling. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't Because it was making early. so much money doing other things. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely interesting, interesting. So the Amistad, I'm glad to see that there's something going to be happening with the Amistad and, well, and kids a, can learn. From, yeah. Are they actually going to get on the ship? Absolutely. Um, we have all sorts of uh, little packages you can do. You can mm. come and go on the ship. You can go on the ship, see our museum. You can come to our museum, make a wooden model of the mm. ship. You can learn about lighthouses if you want just a coastal kind of history. Right. Uh, uh, another good partner of ours is Hempstead Houses, and Hempstead Houses had that um, uh, book about Adam, who was the um, enslaved person. Mm. Uh, at Hempstead Houses, and they hit the diaries that talk about that uh, were big news a year ago when that book was published. And uh, they give another aspect of what slavery was. And Hempstead so, Houses is? Uh, it's uh, a couple of blocks away from where we are. It's part of Connecticut Landmarks. Mm -hmm. And they, they do a lot of... Uh, teaching about uh, slavery and abolition. And in fact, one of the um, Hempstead's 
from a generation or two after Adam uh, married Dwight James who was our abolitionist. Who, oh uh, my goodness, okay. Yeah, so the, it was a, s a small town. Yes, yes. And a small community. And of course, Dwight James, you'd say, oh, well, he was a hero. No, he was run out of town. <laughs> you know, it was not an easy life for abolitionists either. They yes. often burned their houses down yes. because they were going against the money, right? Right, it's the money, it's yes, money it's the money. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. That's what Connecticut was, because Connecticut's been a fairly wealthy state yeah. for centuries. Yes. Yes, from colonial times and slave times to to uh, the Industrial Revolution. And and you know that's it, it is such a great story. And one of the wonderful things about New London is it all fits together in interesting ways. Um, last year was the 175th anniversary of Amistad. It was the 225th anniversary of the establishment of the customs service. Oh. We're in a customs house. Yes. And the show that the retired customs officials put together for San Francisco last year, we're going to get a version of it this year. Wow. And customs, that's why New London was the major customs port in all of Connecticut. In fact, in the colony of Connecticut when it was under King George II and King George III mm. before the revolution. and. Um, Customs, to this day, is responsible for human trafficking. Yes. It's stopping human trafficking. Mm -hmm. And uh, you say, oh, slavery, horrible, those days are done. They're not, not done at all. No, you're right, you're right. And so we're kind of really happy. We're going to have an exhibit about the 226th anniversary right. of U.S. Customs. Yes. Uh, because it will talk about up to the present day dealing mm -hmm. with uh, human trafficking. Wow. And that's an important lesson for kids too when they come to the museum. Absolutely, absolutely. Do you have a, a, a firm date on when that's going to happen? Well, some, you know, it's, it's uh, like I said, we're a community museum right. and the customs agents came to us because they, uh, they want to have a customs museum somewhere. Mm. They've been since September 11th subsumed by a homeland, homeland security, security yes. and they feel their arm neglected, of things yes. yes neglected and and so they like us a lot because we do have a permanent customs exhibit. Mm -hmm. So they're giving us some very good things oh. and they are putting this exhibit together focusing on the partnerships uh, customs the year after customs uh, the Revenue Cutter Service was founded as the arm of customs on the water. Mm -hmm. And that, many years later, which is to say 1915, 100 years ago, is mm -hmm. when the U.S. Coast Guard was actually started. But they're doing a Coast Guard summer, right? stretching it back to the establishment of the Revenue Cutter Service. I see, okay. And um, we are, so we're talking about a while ago, lighthouses. Right. Um, one of the new things we're doing this year, because we've done the harbor tours for several years of the three lighthouses mm -hmm. and local history, we're going to get retired Coast Guardsmen to give a Coast Guard tour of the waterfront. We'll go up the river a little bit to the oh. Coast Guard Academy. Okay. And then talk about the sites. The lighthouses are certainly a big part of what the sure. Coast Guard still does, but there's other other places too that we don't mention. So yes. in honor of Coast Guard summer, yes. we're modifying our program there. Oh, excellent. So the um, the Coast Guard Academy, is is that, oh, the Coast Guard Service was started in, in 1915, is that? The, the, Co the Coast Guard Service was, okay. um, there had been, actually, Customs did all the lighthouses, mm. um, commissioning, buying the oil, selecting the, uh, uh, lighthouse keepers mm -hmm. up until the establishment of the U.S. Lighthouse Service in, say, 1880s. And then when the Coast Guard was formed in 1915, I believe, a number of different services were brought together under the Coast Guard. I see. The Life Saving Service, uh -huh. the um, Lighthouse Service, they were mm -hmm. different 
Sure. And and those all became the um, part of the responsibility and scope yes. of the uh, of the U.S. Coast Guard. Yeah. Fascinating. Fascinating. So it should be a great summer. I, I mean, know that uh, yeah. the city of Groton is doing a whole bunch of stuff for this Coast Guard summer. I oh, had what them, are they doing? They had uh, I had them on as guests on. They're doing art mm -hmm. shows and uh, um, a bunch of different kind of every single month a different event to uh, celebrate Coast Guard summer. I guess they also want to piggyback on to the things that are going on and they are literally across the street from the Academy and part of want to make you know want to make something out of it as well and so with Parks and Recreations and some other organizations they're creating uh, Groton um, City in the summer and mm -hmm. part of that is the celebration of, um, of uh, Coast Guard summer. Good for them. Exactly so well, they you know, should be chatting with you to have some Cross city well, activities. It's a it's a statewide event, mm -hmm. and we're um, we're doing a lot with other lighthouses this year, and um, yeah, it's something everybody can get in on, I think. And uh, but one of the fortunate things about the custom house is we are the a home. custom house. <laughs> yeah, the home of the revenue cutters yes. and the home of you know and we we own three of the lighthouses mm. so we, we we don't have to make anything up. Right, right. It's, it's authentic. Just, it's an authentic. It's time. absolutely authentic. Yeah. Absolutely. And we do it every day. I mean these coast guard cadets who come in they couldn't be nicer. I, mm -hmm. I will say there was a um, uh, this young girl who's come a couple of weeks, and she gives me a big hug when she mm -hmm. leaves. She just loves it. Mm -hmm. She loves history, and it's why she's in the Coast Guard. Okay. And it's, uh, I mean, they just love. The all, every aspect of it. Well, so. I should say there, that beside these exhibitions, you have you have wonderful old paintings. Yeah, we uh, do. We have you know, walls stuff. and walls of old paintings, and yeah. wonderful models of ships, including mm -hmm. ships in a jar, yeah. which are absolutely fabulous to look at. Yeah. So you have this incredibly mind-boggling collection. And uh, not to mention a really super museum shop, yes. which you haven't been there for a while. Oh, yes. But it's really good. We have been working on it a lot because um, every year we think it's going to be the year for New London, mm -hmm. and it's kind of uh, never quite been the year. <laughs> <laughs> but this year we have, you know, like I say, we, if it's not from the outside, we'll do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had big hopes for op sale, but. Upsale was not interested in us. And, right. You know, the, the people who were there, you know, it was just a, a little blip. And we, had, we have great hopes for these things. Mm -hmm. But in fact, at this point, we've done enough where I think we are. Um, we are already the spot on the, on the map for the tourist trade. Exactly. Yeah. Without, with or without the uh, uh, co cooperation of everybody who should be cooperating. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Sure. Absolutely. And we can, you know, and they don't need us. I mm -hmm. mean, uh, there are a lot of things that should go on their own, but the, our natural partners we do really well with. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So. so it's interesting. When you get the Coast Guard uh, cadets, do they? How do they even find out that your museum is even in there? Um, well, uh, at the beginning of the year, when they're freshmen, they all tour around downtown. Ah. So most of them have been to the museum at one time or another. Mm -hmm. And there are various reasons they have to do community service. Okay. Um, uh, if you do something you're not supposed to do, you have to do community, yeah. but, you have to but community think, service as well. But I think everybody does community mm -hmm. service at the Coast Guard. And um, we have all, you know, it's like we, we give the opportunity. And in fact, I told them about the um, need for rigging of the Amistad. That mm. was uh, the, the, the lawyer who was in charge of the ship has not been in charge of a ship before. Okay. And she needs help, and it's way down at this end of the state, and she's in New Haven. So anything I can do to help, I, I tell her. And so I let the Coast Guard know, and they sent a full crew over. And they got it done in one day, and they mm. thought it was going to take about five days. Oh, okay. One well, of the experienced hands. The, sa <laughs> the same weekend, uh, Ledge Light Foundation had the crew of uh, a crew of cadets, I think maybe nine, mm -hmm. go out to Ledge Light. They put down three rooms of carpet, mm 
Mm. Put in some new windows, took the old windows out, and the uh, cadets want to adopt Ledge Light. They oh. had such a good time. Okay. And then that same weekend, we didn't have a crew at the museum, but we had three who helped with the tours. And it's a nice thing, some of the older students who don't feel they have to get you know, do the putting up the tent and all the rigorous work. Mm -hmm. They still have to do their hours of community service. I guess everybody does. And uh, they can come and be in their dress uniforms yes, and yes. be so elegant at mm -hmm. our museum. And they love to hear the stories from Bill, our head docent, Bill LaRue, because his father was a um, very well-respected uh, Coast Guard officer ah. who taught out at Fort Trumbull during World War II and uh, they have a lot of ex he has a lot of stories to tell them right. and they love it. Oh wonderful. Are you thinking maybe you could have him create kind of like an oral history? Um, he won't do it. Oh. We've been thinking that for um, ever, ever since I've been there and he for some reason would never be on your television show or allow himself to be taped so oh. we had him write some of his stories mm -hmm. up and one of our uh, we had a great intern last summer from Connecticut College uh, Cody Chase and she edited a lot of the stories and got them into a docent handbook so that people who come to help us can get his knowledge well we can always um, you know that beside this show I do I, I am a, an author but I also oh, I have a, a publishing company and maybe we can um, publish well, that's an idea. That's Publish an idea. the book and put it in your gift shop. That's a good idea. And and perhaps the Coast Guard Academy would like to get copies of it. And yeah. uh, it might be some minor kind of fundraiser that you could possibly use. Well, so we, we'll have lunch together and chit-chat, as we always like to chit-chat yeah. anyway. No, it's a great idea, Harriet. And, and anything like that, it's... Um, any, any idea I hear, I sort of blanch because we're going full tilt. Yes. But if there's a little help, and we have a lot of volunteers who do help, yes. uh, there's always a way to get it done. And we, we, we are, and, and actually you're right, it's all written. Why shouldn't we publish it? It's exactly. a great idea. All right, so we'll talk about that off camera. Yes. And I want to thank Susan so much for coming. Thank and you, you have, it, So it, it is Coast Guard uh, summer, yeah, but the Coast big Guard thing summer. is you have to go to the museum on Banks street mm -hmm. it's open monday through friday monday through sunday it's open uh every day except for monday okay uh from 1 to 5 p.m we're going to try to make it from uh, at least 10 to 5 but for now it's 1 to 5 p.m the one thing i will say sure is we have two great events coming up we have a uh, very uh renowned musician jin he kim okay who has been uh I mean, she performed at the Metropolitan Museum just this time a year ago. Uh, she does a, a music meditation class. It's just five classes, 45 minutes a day, one week. You don't have to go to all of them, but you have to be there on Friday. It's a wonderful uh, opportunity for something completely different, and we've okay. done it twice before, and people love it. And then we have Bob Walzer, who's going to give a concert on May 13th, and he is uh, the man who started the music program out at Mystic Seaport. Oh. He's, si he's since moved to uh, Minneapolis, but he comes back from time to time. And he's a great ethnomusicologist. He goes out and studies the oyster men and whales and mm. revives all their music. And he's going to give a, a performance, and it's going to be uh, wine and dessert coffee and Bob Walzer. Wonderful. So now you got to get on and all the stuff is on your website? Almost. Almost. All right. <laughs> so you'll go yeah. to the website in about 10 days. Yeah. Well, no, yes. no, no, not 10 days. Go to the website in two days and okay. we'll have it all updated. All right. So we want to have everybody get to the website uh, nlmaritimesociety.org. That's the new London Maritime Society.org. Susan, it has been my absolute pleasure. Oh, yeah. Great, Harriet. <laughs> Thank you. Anytime. Happy and to be here. I also want to let everybody know we here at uh, SEC TV, we all want to promote the arts and culture of our fabulous community. We are holding June 18th. We are having an art gallery opening.
So we want to have all those artists out there. If you're looking for a place to show your art, please get in touch with us, get in touch with me um, or the studio directly. It's graceandharriet at gmail.com. I already have some artists who are coming on board and uh, we're looking for as many as we can. We hope to become the Art Gallery of Groton because we know there's none out there and we as a nonprofit want to serve our community and we hope you'll come by, even if you're not an artist, June 18th at the studio, 5.30 to 8 p.m. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed Susan's show and you must go see the Custom House Maritime Museum and certainly enjoy New London this summer.